just want to welcome everybody to this webinar uh, that the Center for Open Science is uh, running today. It's part of a series of webinars um, where we're trying to highlight some really amazing use cases of our software infrastructure platform, the OSF, but also highlight more broadly um, some kind of best in show um, engagements with open scholarship at uh, different institutions and organizations. Um, and today um, we're going to be engaging with an amazing team um, at Virginia Commonwealth University, led in conversation by Gretchen Giggin, who is our uh, product owner at the Center for Open Science, engaging with OSF institutions, which is um, a, a suite of features on the OSF um, for different types of administrators that uh, everybody will get be getting uh, much deeper um, into today in conversation. Um, but I just want to flag um, as you guys are coming in today that we will be following up um, if you attended or registered for this webinar with a recording of the webinar, with contact information, if you'd like to get in touch with us or our panelists, if they're open to that. Um, and um, and we just want to encourage you to ask as many questions uh, as possible. So we we made the format of this webinar a little bit more open. When we do engage in the Q and A se uh, section at in the last fifteen minutes or so, feel free to take yourself um, off of or on video um, to speak. Or if you feel comfortable, um, you can drop your questions in the Q and A section, um, and uh, our panelists and Gretchen will um, make sure to answer all of your questions. Uh, feel free to drop those in throughout the conversation as well, and, and they they might um, be able to get to them within the conversation. So with that, I'm going to pass over um, the mic to Gretchen Giggin, who is our intrepid uh, product owner for uh, OSF institutions and a librarian and um, is going to be leading this conversation. Great. Thank you, Nadia. So hi, everybody. Um, as said, I'm Gretchen. Um, I will take a minute to have each of our panelists um, introduce themselves. Uh, so I'll start with the person who's immediately to my right, which is Dana. Hello, hello. My name is Dana Lepedo. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Human and Molecular Genetics, and uh, really excited to be here today. Is there anything else you want me to add? No, I think that's fine. Let's just wow. keep Perfect. it simple and get into some good conversation. Um, so going clockwise, then the next on my screen is Tim. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Tim York. I'm a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of Human Molecular Genetics, and I'm also the director of the VCU Data Science Lab, and thank you for the invitation from the uh, Center for Open Science. Great. And then last but certainly not least is Nina. Hi, I'm Nina Exner. I'm an associate professor and the research data librarian for Virginia Commonwealth University. Great. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, so we're gonna, I have some questions. I wanna um, talk to you guys about the work that you're doing at, at VCU. And then uh, we actually uh, met a little bit ahead of time and came up with some things that we would love to get some conversation going um, in, in amongst the whole group. So we may uh, flip the format and ask some questions of our attendees. But as Nadia mentioned, um, at the top, you can also um, ask us questions. I'm monitoring the chat and the Q and A, um, and we would we would just love this to be a, a very informal and, and lively session. But the reason that we wanted to talk with VCU in particular, um, VCU has been a member of our institution's um, program for a while, and we can talk a little bit later about what that really means. But I see we do have a number of other institutions members um, on the chat, so hello, all of you. Um, but we wanted to talk a lot about um, VCU's particular kind of work that they're doing in their data science lab and the relationship of that lab with the campus and the library in particular, um, because we know a lot of our institution members come from libraries, um, and I may be a little bit biased as a librarian myself. Um, but so I'd like to kick it off um, to just talk about the data science lab. Um, what are the goals of the lab? What's the mission? How did you go about creating it? And, uh, you know, how how was that process? So I think maybe Tim or Dana want to kick us off in that question. I'll I'll, I'll grab that one. Um, save the the best for later. Um, so the the VCU Data Science Lab started in two, 2016 officially, and the way it started 
was, as most great things do, with an idea over coffee with one of my former graduate students, um, Dr. Aaron Bolin. And, and we would meet once a week just to talk about things data science this was a, a little a, a while ago so we probably started in 2014 and we've been noticing things that johns hopkins was doing and you see berkeley in the space of data science and we wanted to do the same here at at vcu and so we contacted our department chair and said hey what a crazy idea what about starting a a, a data science lab re re really so we could we could have our own sandbox to do data sciencey things and to teach our students more about data science met with our chair and he said oh no you need to talk to the dean of the school of medicine where human genetics is in the the school of medicine we said oh uh, okay this is getting a little bigger than we thought but we went ahead and did that we met with the dean of the school of medicine and he said no wait you need to talk to the vice president for research at the university and that's in the office for the vice president of research and innovation and we were immediately feeling like we got in way over our head next thing we know we're at a uh, a meeting with all the the, the higher ups of, of research at, at at vcu we got three three slides into our our sort of pitch talk about the vcu data science lab and the vice president told us to stop what you're doing You've already sold us. We're going to do this at VCU. And so that's that's basically, long story short, how we began. And so the VCU Data Science Lab is funded um, at our office, the Vice President for Research and Innovation. Um, we have a modest budget to uh, mostly... Um, 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 have a, and we mostly have a, a, a teaching uh, mission and we can, we can talk more about that. So I'll stop there and, 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 and take any sort of follow-up direction. Just to, um, yeah, follow up on that. It sounds like that was a, you know, nice case of units across the campus working together. Um, but I assume you had to think about and make a case for why this was a, a good, uh, opportunity for the university. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how you pitched it? Yeah, so it, it's definitely from the, uh, the ground up, um, you know, sort of uh, two uh, faculty members thinking, hey, this might be a, a good idea rather coming from the top down. And so we pitched it as we need to formalize the data science training at, at VCU, especially for graduate students in the biomedical sciences. Um, the VCU Data Science Lab serves all departments across the, the university now. And so our, our main mission was education. And we started two um, um, data science uh, courses to, to really teach students how to, to handle data and do it in, in such a way that was open and where their results could be um, uh, uh, had a greater probability of being of being reproducible. And, and so remember, this was about 2014, 2015. And then in 2016, that, I think that a really sort of influential paper came out in, in Nature from Baker et al. Um, asking the question, is there a reproducibility crisis? And that, I think, sealed the deal at VCU. I think that paper said about 90% of the 1,500 uh, respondents said, uh, mostly researchers, scientists, that, yeah, there probably is a reproducible reproducibility crisis going on and and yeah we probably need to do something about it and so uh, i think that really helped us in terms of timing getting um, our administration our leadership um, interested in um, funding something that could could help uh, the research community at vcu uh, tackle this this type of problem Great. So uh, you mentioned that you teach two data science courses. Um, are, what are the other kinds of programs and, and work of the lab? So we also we also do um, workshops. Um, so we try to, it doesn't always happen this way, try to have one or two workshops per, per year. Um, and I think the majority of our workshops revolve around introducing uh, the research community and anybody interested at the university um, to the the open science framework because it's a, a a really sort of nice general, easy to understand um, introduction to um, how to um, um, put open science. 
um, methods into into practice. And so I'm, I'm happy to open it up to Nina or, or Dana if they want to talk about any of the workshops or classes more specifically. But I, but I will say we we partner with um, VCU Libraries and our research data librarian um, Nina. And it's been a very successful relationship. The VCU Data Science Lab is relatively small. It's me and usually one other um, uh, faculty member, plus we try to recruit um, students to help out. And so being able to team up with our libraries and kind of utilize um, a lot of their resources, especially in terms of their ability to to organize and advertise and, and put on these workshops has really been um, a successful sort of partnering for us to kind of get the word out about what we're trying to do. Yeah, one of my next questions was actually about the relationship between the library and the lab. So maybe, Nina, you can talk to us a little bit about how you view um, the kind of cooperation and the relationship and the benefits and maybe the challenges of, you know, this kind of model of, of uh, working with the campus community. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, um, but let me actually close a little bit on the previous question too, um, because we we sort of do some stuff that we all happen to be in sort of as the data science lab, sort of as just a team of people who are interested in data science and the open data space. So for example, we um, have a get a couple of guests slash co-lecturing roles in uh, responsible conduct of research classes. And we have a couple, a more robust one in our transparency and reproducibility course that our trainee, our uh, NIH T programs <laughs> that our uh, institutional trainee programs do for increased knowledge about reproducibility. Those are things where other sponsors that are running programs have said, hey, data science lab people, you guys do this reproducibility, transparency, rigorous um, data science, evolving analysis sort of approach to things. Could you come and give us a talk on your on your part of things? So we do um, also guest in uh, a fair number of, guest lectures and workshops and a fair number of other teaching in addition to the uh, data science labs signature course series. Um, so on the library side, there's a lot of different kinds of perspectives on what the OSF is useful for. And for me, the data science lab is really the practitioner perspective or, or the faculty, the researcher perspective. How do graduate students or new faculty, mostly it could be more established faculty, but uh, I think mostly we get graduate students, postdocs and, and new faculty members and new labs coming in. How do they learn how to use a tool that can help them with their data sharing, with their pre-sharing data management, but in a way that can be shared later if they want to, um, with their collaboration management, with all the different sort of solutions that the, the OSF can work on, but very much focused on the researchers side of, of why and how to use the OSF, which of course is really the, the starting place for everything and the rest of us, our, our benefits for why we want to, to, to do things like a robust preservation plan, like only, only librarians really care and, and other preservationists really care about the robustness of the preservation plan. A faculty member just wants to be able to say, is it good enough to, for, for, prof for someone who cares about that stuff? You said it's good. Okay, good for me then. Um, you know, the, the digital preservation process for is very interesting to librarians and not a whole lot of interest to everyone else. They just want to know it's good. So... I personally the, identify with that statement. Go ahead. <laughs> so one of the things that's uh, good about our collaboration is that we can sort of bring our various strengths, but really focus on the researcher learning process. 
Yeah, it sounds like you have a nice also kind of maybe one of the things that makes it successful is kind of understanding what your particular niches are and your strengths are and being uh, kind of, you know, on the same page about that as opposed to kind of confusion over over roles. And I'd imagine that comes about through, you know, communication and and working together on on a lot of these things. Um, you mentioned uh, kind of OSF and and it fitting into the picture, and I would love to um, talk a little bit about that. Um, so maybe Dana uh, would like to uh, weigh in a little bit on how does how does OSF fit in particular? Um, what do you think is its kind of particular niche or particular strength as a tool? And you know we recognize that OSF is one tool, and we kind of I think one of the strengths of it is that it can be one tool as part of a larger workflow. So um, kind of what are your thoughts on how how you use OSF and how you um, incorporate it into the work of the lab? Yeah, sure. So there there's sort of the the two areas where I would talk about. Um, OSF fitting in, and both of them are in uh, the education space. So specifically with our data science class, we want to have the graduate trainees use something that they could then also use outside of class directly for their research. So making sure that the training that we're doing in class, you know, didactic coursework is investing and directly applicable to what they'll go on and do. And the, the fact is that we have students in our data science class from all over VCU, from the School of Medicine, the School of Pharmacy, School of Nursing, uh, the graduate school. And to try and pick one tool that they could all use that is um, amenable to all of their res resources and research um, areas, I don't think we could do much better than OSF. Uh, we looked around, we we tried to to shop and find something that everyone would be happy with. And OSF by and by and large was the the winner by a mile. You know, you, you'll have folks say, well, I do I do computational work. How about we use GitHub? And you say, well, GitHub is great for what it does, but OSF can play nicely with GitHub. And folks who are not familiar with that specific tool can still interact and collaborate through the OSF so that um that third party add-on ability is wonderful. Um, just for saying this is gonna be agnostic to departments, agnostic to um, approaches, let's let's be inclusive, welcome everyone, we can all work together here. Um, it's, it's a nice uh, area there. And then backing up to the RCR training that uh, Nina and I uh, do, again, we have lots and lots of different programs represented and they are interested in pre-registration they are interested in preprints they are interested in how can i make um my research material bulls shareable when i'm ready to share and osf is just a natural conduit for those kinds of conversations and talking about collaborations and finding other people who are using similar tools um it, it's just so useful in that regard. Uh, it, it's just been a, a natural, uh, I, I want to say compromise point, but it's people don't have to give anything up. That's what's nice. If you're using GitHub, you can still use OSF. If you're using um, so many other uh, programs, but but GitHub has been the main sticking point. And that's why that one's what comes to mind uh, first for me. It's like, ah, I don't want to give up my version control. You don't have to. It's all all good. We can we can all work here. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. Um, and uh, I, I will say, over the coming year, be on the lookout for more and more kinds of uh, OSF integrations. It's a big um, uh, a big goal for us right now. Nina, did you want to add anything about um, the R um, stuff that you just put in the chat? Yeah, I realized that I jumped straight to OSF. For some reason, OSF is on my mind right this second. Um, but a lot of the data science lab projects are really around R and R Studio use uh, as well. So we do a lot of workshops on getting people started in the OSF. But a lot of what we do is sort of fundamentally around, I should say, mostly what they do. I don't really do a lot of the coding part, um, but is mostly around how to do how to make the shift to computational instead of point and click 
graphical user interface uh, approaches to the um, and, and sort of moving transitioning away from Excel. Um, although outside of my data si data science lab work, I do a lot of Excel based stuff. <laughs> inside my data science lab work though, helping people to transition away from Excel, which is sort of much more error prone. Um, and also to use things like version control. And I think I saw um, at least one person who works in RCR uh, in the introductions, um, which are above my camera. That's why I'm gesturing above my head like a like a crazy person. Um, things like having a change log also so that you can see what all has been done with this data in the past. Um, those kinds of benefits are sort of a mix because you can push the R computation to OSF so that it can keep track of your versions. You can jump backwards if you had an error at some point, things like that. Great. Um, so I want to maybe switch a little bit and we can talk about some kind of larger goals and, and larger challenges. Um, so, you know, what are the challenges you encounter in um, your m mission or um, goal of uh, uh, increasing reproducibility? I assume that's one of the big kind of North Star, right? So how do you how do you approach that and what are the challenges that you uh, that you uh see there. Sorry, got distracted by the chat. Um, so, so the question, what are our challenges for kind of introducing these reproducibility sort of um, modern computational tools and methods to the, the research community? Um, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. And our, our angle has always been to get them while they're, they're young is in, in a bottom bottom up sort of a, approach and so that's why and we keep talking about these courses um and so our we have a, a two uh three credit uh, sequence courses in, in data science open to anybody in the university um directed at uh, primarily graduate students and so our philosophy is to teach the students the students go into the lab they demonstrate to their PIs that, oh, hey, look at this really cool stuff we can do that's going to, you know, protect our data, um, you know, and um, hopefully, you know, um, um, aid in making our results more reproducible and more members on our team can access, say, the scripts, the code, the data, the results, et cetera. And then the the PIs say, hey, this is, this is fantastic. Um, they send more students our way. And so um, in terms of challenges, that I think that's that sort of, I'll call it a positive feedback loop there, has taken a little bit of time to, to get going. Um, but I, I think we're, we're hitting our, our stride now. And so the, the word is out about what we can do as a data science lab. We're small. Um, right now, we're really two members and um, a handful of, 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 of students. And so um, I'd, I'd say the first the first challenge is is getting the word out, and that was kind of primarily maybe due to our our strategy. But I, but I'm still gonna I'm still gonna defend that strategy of of teaching students first versus trying to convince, you know, PIs that they need to to change their workflow because we know better. And so, um, I think the other, yeah. Ch yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, please go ahead. Sure. I, th I think the other challenge is that more and more different pockets around our university are, are uh, data science are, are popping up. And one of the challenges is tracking all the different people interested in data science and who have data science um, skills, because we're, we're likely not using, utilizing all of the talent that exists at, at the university. And so, for instance, um, in our computer science department on our academic campus, which is separated from a medical campus by um, by about a mile, um, they've started a, a, a data science certificate uh, master's program. And then in biostats, they, they started a genomic data science program. And so uh, one of our challenges is to keep track of, of all the, the innovations in, in data science that are, that are happening at our, our university. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana, Nina, uh, other challenges from your perspective? I would say uh, two sort of challenges. One, we if we had more people, we could have more sections of the class. You know, the class routinely um, 
goes to wait list and there's only, you know, so many seats in the classroom and we just don't have the personnel. So I think we could, you know, if we, if we were able to do more sections, that would be great. Um, and then just when I think about uh, one of the difficulties on the medical campus with uh, encouraging reproducibility is you can find a lot of people who are eager and they say, well, how do I do this with clinical data? How do I do this with certain, you know, uh, protection levels? And so uh, making sure we talk to people about, well, there are options, you know, and, and walking them through that. Um, so making sure that we are cognizant of everyone's needs and uh, data security issues. Great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, sorry, remembering which way I'm going here. <laughs> um, so these are all great. I think one of the other, you know, big things we had discussed, and maybe this can be the beginning of, although I do have one other thing I want to talk about, but, um, we'd love to get some audience participation. Um, so we, we, you know, we've talked about these challenges and the strategies that you're using to kind of address them and, and what your, your, your goal is and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but a big question is how do we, how do we determine if we've been successful? Um, you know, what kind of measures of success do we think are valuable? Um, you know, what are you looking for? Um, and we'd love to hear, you know, through the chat, um, ideas from the audience about things that they find um, to be real uh, key indicators of success for your uh, overall open science efforts. Yeah, I mean, along those lines, while, while people are kind of putting their ideas in the, the chat, I think, um, you know, for, for us starting small, um, having, you know, students fill the seats in our courses and having a wait list gives us some indication of success that, you know, what we're, we're teaching is, is useful. Um, that sort of positive feedback loop where we hear stories about PIs and, you know, program directors saying, oh, you need to take, you know, data science courses. They, you know, teach you um, kind of how to use, utilize R and to automate things and to avoid sort of manual mistakes like Nana was talking about, um, how to, um, um, you know, use the, you know, utilize the OSF to your advantage, like, like Dana was talking about. And so for us, those are indicators of success. Um, the Center for Open Science also gives us a report from our, you know, some metrics from the dashboard, which are kind of um, even sort of like um, developing and sort of gives us a sense of how, how many um, individuals at the at our university are, are utilizing the OSF. And we always see sort of a, a bump after we do a, a workshop or students in our class have, all have an assignment where they have to um, um, create an OSF page. And so um, to, to, to us, those are very simple uh, metrics of, of success, but I, I would love to hear everybody's ideas about um, maybe what they track or um, other kind of ideas for gauging whether or not we're we're getting the the message out to our our research community. Yeah, and it's a little hard to benchmark. I think I'd also like to see how other people. It doesn't have to be OSF particularly. How uh, uh, other campuses are thinking about tracking or benchmarking or, or assessing and evaluating their uptake on on open science, on reproducibility or transparency practices. Um, we've, in addition to things like how many registered users do we have, uh, especially maybe proportionate to the size of the campus, um, and how many people register for the class, although the class is, is kind of a uh, the, the class series always maxes out. And so that's, if it's always full, that's not going to um, represent a growth. It's a ceiling. Necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really a ceiling on, on capacity. Um, I think how many people then change their practices afterwards, which can be a, a small number in a way, but then I think 
thinking about how many people you, you train on a thing and then they actually go and implement that and have, have a major change in behavior afterwards, you would expect you know, one in a hundred people maybe to, to, to totally change their approach to how they're, how they're handling uh, their analytical pipeline from being ad hoc and closed to being computational, reproducible, and open. Like, I would normally expect that to be a very small number. So um, that is an important story, maybe, to know how many people have made a major change to what they're doing. And I think we get that information anecdotally. We hear yeah. through the grapevine, or we get an email, or... You know, like I said before, they yeah, I send their students to our classes and our and our workshops, or they they attend themselves. Um, that that's how we get that information. I've been hesitant to sit, send out a Google survey to, you know, to the university explicitly asking people kind of their 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 behaviors, but I suppose that that's an option um, an option too. I was flabbergasted the first time someone said, I need methods help with my thesis. Can you help on my thesis committee? Oh, and also I need to pre-register. I was like, you want to pre-register your thesis? Really? <laughs> um, it was just, it wasn't someone I had worked with in data science specifically. They weren't in data science specifically. They were actually doing mixed uh, social mixed methods and they still wanted to pre-register. And I was like, wow that's really cool let's see how we can get through this um so that's really interesting cool stories it, it kind of um ties together a couple of things i wanted to also talk about and also with a question that we have in the chat which is about um so so follow me on this my brain is pulling all these things together in real time um <laughs> so you talked a little bit about the institutional membership in essentially in in talking about the metrics that you get um in terms of who's who's using osf and there's a question in the chat also about um the role you might play in facilitating institutional engagement as opposed to encouraging individuals so um is that something that you think about is that something that you plan for um and by that by that I mean, kind of um, in an institutional message um, related to OSF usage and or uh, the benefits of kind of being involved at the, as an institutional member, which, you know, provides you things kind of on top of what you get with OSF for free, which is, you know, the metrics and the uh, um, community events we're trying to build and, and uh, you know, the SSO sign-in and, and those sorts of things. So is there any thought about kind of, the uh, larger impact of that membership and whether or not there's a plan for kind of um, building that or thoughts on how you could, um, you know, get more out of that um, institutional um, benefit. Yeah. So um, kind of one idea, and I'm not sure this kind of really answers the, the question, but it, but it's one idea, and it, it's not really contingent. I think on an institutional membership, but I think the institutional membership um, gives this process legitimacy um, in, in some respect. You know, when you actually sign in through your your you know using your your VCU credentials, for instance, your university credentials, is that instead of targeting just the individuals through class from a a, a ground up approach, is using kind of the I mean, it's important. It's important to 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 utilize these these practices, these open science practices. Um, and so, we've thought about things such as for um, institutional uh, grants, pilot grant money, that researchers who are awarded grants, for instance, would be required to um, put their their the products of the the research onto an OSF page, you know, whether private or, or public, you know. You know that could differ by the, the different components when, within the the OSF, but um, for instance, so that those products of the research that that the institute funded can be available to to other researchers more more rapidly. You know, because pilot studies don't always get published, but that's a way to utilize the o OSF at the institutional level to make sure um, that you know what they're funding is is made. You know. Is version controlled, stored somewhere else, not just on a PI's laptop, but available to the rest of the community at research community at, at VCU. So, so that's 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 one idea. Mm -hmm. 
Our campus uh, does have a data cataloging initiative, which is run completely separately, um, other than that it's housed in Somtech, I think. And no, it's not even. Um, it's totally separate. Primarily has a different goal than overall visibility of data sets. Um, but we have institutionally, again, beyond the, the DSL, but I think in collaboration with, because several of us have been in a lot of the same meetings, um, there's been discussion, uh, we're NIH heavy and so, uh, but, but even in the larger context of uh, reproducibility and also some of the um, White House science and technology policy discussions about data that is shared that comes from research needs to be in an environment that is harvestable by uh, regularly sort of used search engines. It needs to have a DOI. It needs to have some sort of JSON output of the metadata, which probably for a lot of folks just sounded like I went into, into foreign language there. Um, but it needs to be compatible with um, the the right kinds of things so that if someone is Google searching for that data set, it'll happen. That's in, for for non techy people sort of gets into more gory details than anyone really cares about. But when we talk to the IT folks, they're like, oh, it's compatible with this and it's got that kind of output and it's got this kind of benchmarking from a technological perspective. Um, and so in that sense, it institutional discoverability is supported and when we talk about institutional discoverability usually with our, our tech heads on or our policy heads on um, we tend to get good responses about that so I wouldn't say so much that it's been a driving in part of the initiative but people do tend to say like oh we're already doing something with a thing that schema.org metadata compatible oh Phew, that's one less problem on our plate. <laughs> so it it fills a need, but I don't know that we've got a current cohesive initiative around that. Um, that might not be an entirely satisfying answer, Nicholas. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, if there's a follow-up from that, Nicholas, um, please do put that in the question uh question section or the chat. Um would anybody else like to to weigh in on any other thing before uh, we we switch over to maybe some more open discussion questions? Any any other follow ups to questions we've asked or um, something we haven't haven't mentioned? I've done an excellent job interviewing, I guess, um, which is not true. It never happens. Okay, so <laughs> when we met a little bit ahead of time, we did talk about some questions that we would love to get, uh, you know, some input from uh, the attendees. Um, so we already talked about one about success. Um, another one uh, we talked about is whether people are... Um, uh, specifically supporting reproducibility or just repository services. Nina, I don't know if you want to um, uh, follow up or, or add some more detail to that um, since it was your, your, your question. There's reproducibility and transparency means so many different things to so many different people. And it's such a sort of complex continuum. Uh, and I see a lot of people in the participants list that I respect a lot for <laughs> for their contributions and hard work in transparent data sharing. And so I'd be interested to hear um, just what kind of advice or strategies or starting point people have thought about. We can throw some of ours in there too, but <laughs> I'd love to hear yeah, from the I mean, audience. What, what, why don't you answer your own question? <laughs> So there's a few different things I think we do. Um, and a lot of them are different approaches to the flexibility of how to use o the OSF or, or other tools, um, especially RStudio also. But things like 
how do you transition to it as a lab notebook, a sort of collaborative note-taking environment for one or more people? That's one use case that we tend to chat about with users um, and sort of present a few examples of, well, this lab has done things this way, uh, small L lab. Um, and the, and that gives some people one way to sort of envision, all right, I've got this wiki, which I could take notes in, or I could do other stuff in. I've got this file dropping area. I've got these plugins or, or add-ons in, in OSF parlance, but, but what do I do with those different parts? Um, I've got this change log and, and I don't even know why that's there from a lot of users perspectives. Um, and so one of the ways that we work with that is, is sort of talking about if you wanted to use it as an electronic lab notebook environment, here's how you would do that. If you just have your basic science person and you're looking for somewhere that you can share a couple of spreadsheets, <laughs> um, a couple of Excel files to link to your latest journal article, here's, here's our use case for how you do that. So um, sometimes that's an OSF centric way that we do things. At the opposite end of the spectrum in a non-technological approach, we've had reproducibility um, discussion journal club events. That's tea mm -hmm. with, a, with as in the tea that you drink. Um, mm -hmm. We So we've done journal club open discussions that are just like, here's stuff that's happening. Um, so those are a few types of initiatives. Highly recommend reproducibility as a great starting place for people who are just like, want to do a smallish bite-sized uh, reproducibility mm -hmm. and transparency something. But I'd love to hear other people's thoughts yeah. on what they're doing on campuses. We are still open to adding your your thoughts on on the in the chat about how you're addressing reprodu reproducibility um, in addition to kind of repository research, uh, services and, and requirements. We do have a question in the chat, um, though, which is related, which is about advertising the OSF platform, um, especially OSF projects. And um, specifically, Moriana is asking about um, advertising this to humanists and humanities department. And I know that may not be where um, some of your wheelhouse is, but um, at some point, hum humanities will have to share data um, if it's federally funded, right? That's part of the new uh, White House mandate. Um, so do you have any yourselves or in the chat um, examples from other institutions about that particular audience and how you might um, reach out to them? So this question has exposed our soft underbelly. Um, we struggle. So we're based on the, the medical campus. And so we don't have a strong presence on our what we call our academic campus, which is you know, um, geographically away from us. And so mm -hmm. that's where we need to move to. And so any ideas, you know, we would love to hear them from anybody else, how mm -hmm. these technologies can be introduced to kind of humanities departments. Um, we have a, a big art department here at VCU and, and I'd love to, to figure out how to use some of these, these techniques and tools, um, how, how people in, in those departments might be able to use those tools. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We did do a blog on the Center for Open Science um, about replication in the humanities and case studies. I'll just put that in the chat. Um, Looks like we have a hand raised. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't notice that. Moriana, yeah, that's Moriana yes. asked the question, <laughs> yeah. so please follow up. I'm, I, I'm the one with the question. Yes, I'm following up because we have other products, for example, for scientists like lab archives where they can, you know, create their uh, uh, lab environment. But the I, I have a science background too. So what I struggle to think about how can I reach to the humanist. I'm a scholarly communication librarian. And um, uh, what I think is the OSF projects can provide a platform where humanists can collect all the materials 
that they use for their research. Yes, humanists do research. They, it's just different. It's, it's full of images and articles and books and, uh, I don't know, documents. Uh, but it could provide them to, to a place to start collecting everything and, and sharing and collaborating with others. Uh, that's why I'm focusing on, on, on the project. So I just wanted to, yes, I, I think the where is I'm going and the digital people working in digital humanities projects might be, I think, the prime targets for these. But yeah, and it it would be a good if you do work at a university with a digital humanities center or some um, some folks working in it. I mean, that's a great first place to try and do some collaborative effort with da- because it, uh, it's data mining, right? In a lot of cases, um, and and it's a very data um, focused discipline in some. Some some parts of it. I actually started out in digital humanities, so it has many many different kinds of um, kinds of um, ways it can be done. But so, thank yeah. you. I think it would be a lovely place to put maybe not the interface for a portfolio, although it's feasible that way. But it wouldn't have a sort of look and feel. But you could do the all of the objects that you were going to put in a portfolio. And that would seriously decrease the amount of storage that you might need in whatever Mm -hmm. design platform you use for the the interface part of the portfolio. Um, Also, project tier, with that's more social sciences than humanities, but um, for sort of the social humanities and the... um, some of the the overlap areas project tier has an osf uh starter arrangement that a person can clone if they want to use that um Mm -hmm. i will look that up and stick it in the chat we we have an example of a i'm sorry dana (laughs) please you go ahead (laughs) talked enough oh i was just gonna say we've also had good conversations through um the library's open educational resources a group because that brings people together across the academic and medical campuses. And so we've been chatting about, well, could OSF help um, with some of these uh, courses and also projects in the courses to get folks used to using the OSF to organize uh, their independent research projects? Yeah, that's a. We've also heard from a lot of folks about OER um, over the last couple of years. It's a, obviously a very hot topic in a lot of higher ed. Um, I was going to say we do. I can think of one example in OSF because you can redirect the URL where you can put your materials in OSF and redirect to a different homepage um, that you know may display or contextualize better um, than the OSF does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that for institutional members and and will be available more broadly, but um, we're going to be very soon starting a group to try and gather a lot of these support ex- resources, examples, templates, things to help folks who are trying to um, figure out all of these flexible ways of using the OSF, a better starting place um, for understanding um, the possibilities. Um, oh, does anybody else have any other things they'd like to add? Um, we do have... Um, Uh, something on metrics in the chat, but any other thoughts about humanities or just promotion um, engaging um, in outreach? Excuse me. I would just say that um, coming up, uh, our partnership in terms of outreach, our partnership with uh, VCU libraries, particularly, I think, Nina, you, you might be organizing this event, is the I Love Data Week over the mm-hmm. in middle of February, um, mm-hmm. a whole yes. slew of events. I think that's actually on the academic campus. Part of um, our Love Data Week is going to include an OSF workshop. Include an OSF workshop, yeah. Yep. Glad to hear it. We'll, so that's, we'll follow uh, up about that. One day, that's mul- over multiple days. Great. It looks like we have another hand up from Leanne, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hello everyone. It's been very great to listen to this discussion. Um, so I think on both sides of how to expand this, but also in terms of looking at metrics, um, one thing that may be helpful is actually having these conversations with the departments in terms of what does it look like for, you all mentioned that reproducibility and transparency looks very different for these departments. 
but it's certainly something that I know as a qualitative researcher has been on our radar of how do you improve this. And although it may look very different from, of course, the data science groups, I think having that open discussion of how these tools can be helpful for them and how does it fit into their workflow and view of research and, and what this means for open science within these disciplines can be really helpful in expansion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, we obviously are, you know, looking at OSF and reproducibility from like a mile high. So, you know, understanding the details um, is important. And it all comes down to, you know, personal relationships in some sense of, you know, relationships across campus and with departments. Um, in the chat, also related to metrics, um, Nicholas noted that um, uh, encouraging, you know, higher institutional buy-in into things like Helios, um, for the higher education leadership initiative for open scholarship um, can be a, a great way of, of of thinking about things and seeing who's there in the open. Uh, he, he listed a link to the um, to the members, um, and you know, showing an, an administrator that their peer institution is involved in something that they're not involved in is always you know usually pretty persuasive. <laughs> um, while we wait for another question, um, w was there another um, question that the panelists were interested in asking? Um, I'm looking at what we had the other day. Um, any other uh, questions about um, measuring success or promotion and outreach? Yeah, Nina mentions in the chat the Scan All Fish project, which is our favorite example project here at the Center for Open Science. <laughs> Um, there's also a project that has uh, hundreds of images of crocodiles, I think, um, but uh, they're really fascinating um, projects. I think in terms of um, specifically the institutional membership features, being able mm -hmm. to get some more metrics on our, our user base is would be helpful for us in terms of knowing where across the university OSF, for instance, is being utilized and maybe what departments, what schools that we need to to target. Um, I maybe a year or two ago started exploring kind of being able to get some of that metadata from the registered um, users. And that's something that I need to re revisit. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be, I, I don't know if, um, I, I do see now in, in on the public profile or the profile information on on OSF for each user, there are there are fields to enter your your department or institute and your your job title even, and so maybe mm -hmm. being able to access that information, um, mm -hmm. I think for in my people in my position, you know, knowing where to to target resources on um, getting the word out about, for instance, OSF would be would be useful. Right. Like you, you've mentioned anecdotes about, you know, someone approaches you who's using it and you weren't aware. Right. So knowing where that activity is happening and that is something that we can support. It requires a little bit of additional, um, coordination to be able to get that information out of your directory service. Um, but if we can, it's, it's possible to do that and, um, we can follow up with you. And for anyone else who's a member out there, um, that is something that we can, we can work into it. Um, we're also going to be starting a project, um, hopefully in the next two weeks, um, to begin talking about how to improve our metrics dashboard and our metrics report um, to see what other metrics would be really useful um, and what other, um, uh, you know, what else we can, we can get, what else we um, can, you know, tweak things to try and find what, what would be helpful um, in terms of those metrics. That is, um, particularly to the library audience, um, I sometimes like to pitch it as, you know, the people on the campus are going to do what they want. And so they're already using OSF. So you might as well know what they're doing <laughs> and be able to get a sense of where that activity is happening. Not that using OSF is a bad thing. Um, it is a good thing. So it can be a virtuous circle, right? Like you find out who's already using it and then you know where to target your efforts to get even more um, folks to use it. Um, so those those factors are, are key um, in success. Um, and yeah, we have a link to Crockbase in the in the chat, and I I recommend to anybody who's got um, some time to kill to go and check out both of those projects, Scan All Fish and Crockbase. They're they're pretty fun. 
Um, we're getting close to the end of the hour. So I just want to put out a last call to anybody. Um, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment um, in the chat or raise your hand. Um, also to our panelists, if there's any last um, things you would like to mention, um, please go ahead now. Um, but if not, we can move to thanking you um, for being a part of this. It was, it was really great to talk with you all. Um, we appreciate it and um, hope that uh, folks out there are interested and inspired and, and want to learn more about OSF and, and want to, um, you know, take back some of these um, ideas to their institution to uh, increase open science and reproducibility. Um, so I'll stop talking if there's anybody uh, else who would like to make any um, last comments. I mean, I'll just end saying um, thank you for the invitation. And I think use cases for the OSF, the sky's the limit. And our DS, our data science lab is, is small. And so um, it's, all, I think, only going to grow and get better when we include other sort of members from across the university to kind of share what potential use cases, you know, could could exist. Um, we're, mm -hmm. we're focused on biomedical research right now, but ex expanding, I think, is sort of the the next stage for for us. And it's only going to get this OSF and open science outreach um, kind of to to be able to prop propagate further throughout the university. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, just a note, we will be sharing the contacts for the panelists and a recording of the webinar to everyone who registered. Um, so uh, be on the lookout in your email for that. Um, if you have any questions about OSF or OSF institutions, um, I am happy to, uh, to talk about it. Um, and uh, other than that, I think I'll just wish everybody a good afternoon. And uh, thanks again to all our panelists and all our attendees. Um, so thanks, and we hope to see you at the next one.